Milton Bridge, which spanned the west branch of the Susquehanna River between Northumberland and Union counties, failed March 27, 1987. The New York Thruway Bridge, located 40 miles west of Albany, failed April 5, 1987. These bridges fail due to scour created by high local water velocities that undermine the piers. Currently, national bridge inspection standards require every bridge to be inspected at least every two years. A major area of concern and one that is not fully understood is what actions, reactions, occur below the surface of the water out of view of the inspector. This program will show what can and does occur below the water line how bridge inspectors can use surface indicators to help make below surface judgments and provide some possible methods for combating underwater bridge deterioration. The Milton Bridge, built in 1920, was a through steel plate girder bridge with 19 spans. The designer utilized the masonry piers of a former covered wooden bridge. These piers were founded on timber mats sunk below the stream bed and intermediate concrete piers were constructed on spread footings and placed between the masonry piers. The stream bed at the point of the pier failure is composed of silty sand and gravel for the first two to five feet and sandy silt with weathered limestone for the next five feet. The New York Thruway Bridge constructed in 1953 was composed of simple steel spans supported on spread footings founded on gravel and boulders. An investigation found scour of the foundation material causes most flood-related problems. Proper inspection will help transportation departments identify and address problems associated with scour before catastrophes occur. <laughs> defined as the removal and transportation of material from the bed and banks of rivers and streams as a result of the erosive action of flowing water. Scour at bridge openings can be classified into three types, general, constriction, and local. General scour occurs as a result of natural stream bed degradation because of high velocity flood flows, migration of the main channel, or lowering of the entire stream grade due to man-made changes, upstream or downstream of the bridge. As an example, the placement of a dam upstream of the bridge will tend to lower the stream bed elevation and cause general scour through the bridge opening. Constriction scour is a result of the constriction of flow in the main river channel or floodplain, usually caused by the encroachment of highway embankments. Constriction scour may be caused by trees, trailers, or other debris carried by floodwaters clogging waterway openings. Local scour is a result of high local velocities and vortices caused by obstruction to flow like a pier or a button. Local scour is usually most severe upstream of the foundation, although the resulting scour hole sometimes extends completely around the foundation. The total scour that occurs in the stream bed is the sum of the three types. While all three types of scour are of interest, this program will focus on only one major cause of bridge pier erosion, local scour. Several parameters affect its development. High local velocities that occur due to the constriction of flow. Downflow and associated vortices that form on the upstream side and flanks of the pier and the erodibility of the bed material. Velocity and angle of the approaching flow are the two most important parameters. 
This aerial view of the down Milton Bridge provides dramatic emphasis to that statement. Note the velocity of the water through the available channel. As velocity increases, the depth of scour will increase, and as the pier width, that is, the amount of pier that the water actually strikes, increases, the potential for scour increases. Increases to the point that the ultimate result is almost preordained. Downflow and the vortices that form around the pier are illustrated by the movement of the string and its adjustment to the current around the pier at the stream bed. The erodibility of the bed material is a factor in determining the magnitude of scour. A cohesive material, such as consolidated clay, will offer much more resistance than a non-cohesive silt, sand, or gravel. Pier and foundation shape affect scour hole development. Round piers are streamlined and generally are unaffected by changes in flow alignment, while for rectangular piers, a slight change in the approach flow angle will increase the scour potential. In general, the more streamlined a pier, the less scour that will occur, as long as the approaching flow direction remains constant and aligned with the pier. Special attention should be given to streams where the flow has changed direction and no longer is aligned with the piers. Expanding the standard bridge inspection to identify, evaluate, and record scour indicators is important if undermining of piers and abutments due to that scour is to be recognized and acted upon. The inspector must be aware of the physical signature that scour leaves. Some scour takes place in all stream beds, particularly at flood stage. However, the characteristics of the channel influence the amount and type of scour. Accelerated local scour occurs where there is an interference with the natural stream flow. For example, approach embankments extended into the river or piers and abutments located in the main channel. The amount of scour depends upon the degree the stream flow is disturbed by the bridge and the erodibility of the river channel. Scour depth may range from zero in bedrock to 30 feet or more in very unstable rivers. In determining the depth of local scour, it's necessary to differentiate between true scour and apparent scour. As the water level subsides after flooding, scour holes tend to refill with sediment. Elevations taken of a stream bed at this time usually will not reveal true scour depth. Since material carried and deposited by the water will sometimes appear different from the original material, it may be possible to determine scour presence by noting the differences in the appearance of the bed material in your inspection report. If, for example, a layer of loose sand is found on an otherwise hard stream bed, it is reasonable to assume that the scour extends down to the bottom of the layer of loose sand. This can often be confirmed by probing, provided the scour depth is limited to a few feet. The river bottom around piers or abutments should be checked for the development of scour holes. Scouring here can adversely affect the stability of the structure. Report it because an in-depth underwater inspection may be warranted. The adequacy of the waterway opening under the structure should be noted since the amount of debris carried during flood periods can be considerable. Inadequate freeboard for ice and debris presents a serious threat to the structure during high water. If you know the high water, high ice, and or debris levels, with or without the date of their occurrence, record for future reference. Obstructions such as debris or growth of vegetation could contribute to scour and may be a potential fire hazard to the structure. Sand and gravel bars deposited in the channel may direct stream flow causing harmful scour at piers and abutments. Additionally, the surrounding areas should be inspected to see if the bridge and its approaches are causing any problems or potential problems. Items to look for include possible flooding from inadequate openings at the structure, erosion of banks or levees, or skew of the piers or abutments. Ideally, waterways should be inspected during and immediately following periods of flood, since the effects of high water will be most apparent at these times. Because this is not always possible, a knowledge of the height of past major floods from stream gauging records or from other sources 
together with observations made during or immediately following high water, are helpful in determining the adequacy of the waterway openings. Observations include high water marks or ice scars left on trees, water marks on painted structures, debris wedged beneath the deck of the bridge or on the bridge seats, information from local residents, water, when there is too much of it has to go somewhere, an insufficient freeboard is a prime identifier of an inadequate waterway and one that should be monitored during high water. In stream beds susceptible to scour and degradation, a channel profile should be taken periodically. Generally, 100 foot intervals extending to a few hundred feet upstream and downstream of the structure should be sufficient. This information, when compared with past records, will often reveal problems such as scour tendencies, shifts in the channel, and degradation. The footing should be examined for any evidence of significant scour or undercutting. Inspection during the lowest water elevation will facilitate this work. Probing will be necessary at many piers. Particular attention should be given to foundations on spread footings where scour or erosion can be more critical. The vertical support capacity normally will not be greatly affected unless the scour is excessively severe, but the horizontal stability may be jeopardized. This condition becomes particularly unstable when erosion has occurred on one face of a pier only, leaving solid material on the opposite face. Horizontal loads also may have been produced by earth or rock fills piled against or adjacent to substructure units loads that were not provided for in the original design. Such unbalanced loading can produce an unstable condition, which must be recorded so that corrections can be made. The substructure that is exposed below normal water level should be examined for any deterioration of the concrete or for loss of the protective stone facing of the rubble masonry piers and for any indication of pier movements. Timber piles must be checked for insect damage and deterioration, especially for decayed areas where they are alternately wet and dry. The most likely place for this condition to be found is at the ground line. Foundation movements may often be detected by first looking for deviations from the proper geometry of the bridge. With the exception of curved structures, haunched members, and steeply inclined bridges, Members and lines should usually be either parallel or perpendicular to each other. While not always practical, especially for bridges spanning large bodies of water or for those located in urban industrial areas, careful observation of the overall structure for lines that seem incongruous with the rest of the bridge is a good starting point. For a more detailed inspection, the following methods are often useful. Check for scour or erosion around the abutment and for evidence of any movement, sliding, rotation, etc., or settlement. Stone masonry should be checked for cracking in the mortar joints and to see that the pointing is in good condition. Check for erosion, cavities, cracking, and other deterioration of the stones. The latter is becoming an increasing problem in the areas where de-icing salts from the roadway are carried down by drainage through joints and cracks in the superstructure. The horizontal surfaces of the tops of piers and abutments are particularly vulnerable to this attack. Even as this video was being produced, the Federal Highway Administration released interim procedures for evaluating scour at bridges. While the duties of bridge inspectors may vary somewhat from one transportation agency to another, there are strongly supported guidelines common to all. They are in this manual and easy to follow steps guidelines and suggestions identified and supported. For example, the recommendations for a systematic approach to inspection. You begin with the office review. Has a scour evaluation study been made? Is the bridge scour critical? This is a reinforced concrete bridge over Butternut Creek in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. Scour critical due to terrain. Water flow reaching the area of the bridge does so with such velocity that it has actually moved boulders two feet and more in diameter. Scour countermeasures were installed. In this case, the stream bed under and immediately adjacent to the bridge was paved. 
While this is an extreme example, it demonstrates what can be done to reduce scour effect. Refer to the stream bed cross sections from previous inspections. Is the stream bed stable, degrading, aggrading, moving laterally? Review your equipment needs. Are there aerials or sketches to give you information on whether the main channel is changing direction? What type of foundation does the bridge have? Are there special items like debris problems? A thorough office review increases the quality of your field inspection and helps to ensure that you come back with the needed information. During the actual bridge inspection, the waterway opening, substructure, channel protection, and scour countermeasures must be given special consideration. You must look upstream, at the bridge and downstream to adequately evaluate the overall conditions. Upstream for bank stability, condition of main channel, floodplain, debris. At the bridge for substructure, superstructure, channel protectors, scour countermeasures, waterway area, and downstream of the bridge for bank stability, condition of the main channel, floodplain. Your inspection may reveal the need for an underwater bridge inspection. While diving operations will normally be conducted and supervised by a specialist, it is incumbent upon the bridge inspector to assist in these operations in whatever way possible. To assist the diver, the bridge inspector should define what bridge components to inspect, list what inspection tasks are to be accomplished, provide any helpful reference data, such as previous inspection reports, prepare as much as practical the bridge site beforehand, ensure that a boat with a train crew is ready, and provide information about the water quality. Bridges with underwater members that cannot be visually evaluated during periods of low flow or otherwise effectively examined for condition are to have an underwater bridge inspection at least every five years. Bridge inspectors should receive appropriate training and instruction so that they may accurately record the present condition of the bridge and the stream, so that they may identify conditions that are indicative of potential problems with scour and stream stability, and be able to promptly notify others for further review and evaluation of their findings. To obtain those, there must be guidelines for the inspector as to when the bridge should be closed. Any existing rotational movement of abutments and piers, foundation settlement, information on rates of stream bed degradation, aggradation, or lateral movement, maximum permissible scour depths, flood flows, water elevations, inspection procedures for scour countermeasures, procedures for checking stream bed levels. The Federal Highway Administration recommends the use of a black and white pathometer for checking stream bed levels in deep channels where accurate measurements cannot be made from the bridge. Finally, the inspector must be provided with reporting methods and procedures for his findings. If there is a key to the identification of potential scour, it is inspection. Frequent, detailed inspection. Recorded, reported, and evaluated. If we don't find it, someone else may. Thank you.